So Jack Parsons, let's talk about Jack, a fascinating character. They recently made a um, documentary or, or, or a drama documentary. Called, what was it called? Strange Angel, wasn't it? Yes, yes. I was on uh, CBS TV in America, yeah. Mm. Essentially, he was like the guy that was originally behind NASA, absolutely fascinated with rockets and he, and the attempt to get one into space. And he, him and his buddies operated out the desert in, in California, so sort of Hollywood sort of area. And um, I don't know. I like to think at some point he found this experiment so difficult you know the rockets were all flying off. They, they, they certainly weren't weren't getting anywhere near quote unquote space, whatever whatever that might be. And he got invited to Thelema, which was Alistair Crowley's. What do we call that? Like a cult, a dark dark religion or something? It's just basically a religion. It's not even dark. It's just is it a religion? Yeah. And uh, well, what happened was he grew up in a. He grew up in Southern California, and he, since he was a boy, him and his friend Ed were obsessed with um, science fiction. It's it's very interesting. It's it's almost like a, it's almost like a, a chaos magic life in itself. And they were obsessed with science fiction, and they used to build little rockets in Pasadena in their backyard, and they would blow blow try to launch rockets. So he became in, interested in rockets, and uh, he basically his family fell out of money and things like that. So he ended up kind of you know, working in factories and chemical plants, stealing chemicals to try and build his own rockets as a hobby. And uh, they and we're, we're the same friends from school. And uh, with some success, I might add, they, they actually, you know, made some liquid fuel rockets, the, our chemical fuel rockets, enough for the U.S. military and JPL laboratories in Pasadena. That's Jet Propulsion Labs, not Jack Parsons Labs. That became a kind of a joke later. But... Uh, to give him grants to actually develop a rocket thruster for aircraft. The Americans were not interested in rockets. They were having tremendous success with aviation and building airplanes. So they, they didn't really have an interest in rockets. Uh, so he, he he formed a company, a jet propulsion company, Aerojet Company, and they, they successfully built during World War II thousands of these rocket motors to give an aircraft a, a boost, right? And uh, while this was all going on, he was in underneath a Hollywood sign. He heard about this thing called. He was always interested. In, he was, an, you know, was an educated man. He was the head of the, the Los Angeles Science Fiction Club, and he was always interested in offbeat things. And he was invited to this uh, this this Thelema group in 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 Hollywood, and they had a thing called the the Gnostic Mass, and it's basically an, a, a mass that they do, and it just blew his mind. And so he he realized that there were answers here that were outside the, that explained the strange things in science or in accidents that should have like accidents that went wrong, but they actually turned out to be the right thing. There was like a, an unseen force in the universe. And he, he he drew himself wholly into magic and the occult. At the same time, he was building the rockets. At the same time, he was in contact before World War. This is before World War Two with Werner von Braun, who eventually invented the Saturn V rocket. He was shocked, and all the Americans were shocked, to find out just how far behind the rockets were in America compared to Germany. The Germans were light years ahead. But And Ver, Ver, Werner von Braun was also a science fiction head, which is very interesting. These guys were brought, they, they took science fiction and made it into reality in many ways. His life, he, he started this thing called the Agape Lodge, which was in Pasadena. And it was um, basically a kind of a, a hippie loving thing before the hippies came along. And he was getting paid a good salary then by Aerojet Corporation. So he had this like commune, we call it a commune, of like artists and writers and, you know, good looking women and stuff like that. After a while, this guy called L. Ron Hubbard comes in, who goes on to be the founder of Scientology. Jack Parsons becomes spellbound by him mainly because Parsons had lacked his father walked out on him when he was young and he had this long-term need for a father figure. And he got interested, he introduced to people like Crowley through dialogue and letters. And Crowley and Parsons became kind of surrogate father figures for him. They became, his, you know, he used to write to Crowley in England saying, my beloved father and things like this. And there's a genuine affection there. Now, Crowley was getting, was getting on at this point. Now, they... 
Parsons and Hubbard really got into magic and they have this concept of creating something called the moon child. And it's a really amazing story. There's a book by Crowley. It's an actual fictional novel. I mean, it's quite a fun read called Moonchild. I had a copy. I don't know where it is here. And it talks about a, a, an occult group who implanted into a woman a magical child called the Moonchild with, uh, with the process of making the human race eligible for the next stage of reality. You know, this kind of thing. Now, this was to appeal to Parsons and Hubbard in some way, because maybe they were th Parsons was probably thinking, it's not going to be easy for humans to, to exist in space. As we found out, it's not. It's really, they come back with all kinds of health problems and mental problems and everything. So maybe this idea of the moon child appeared to him, that we would actually build the, the human that would be ready for space. Something that uh, Stanley Kubrick played around with in 2001, and Arthur C. Clarke, the moon did the star child. They went out into the, the Mojave Desert and, and did this invocation called the Babylon Working. And it was to it was to get basically the whore of Babylon, and uh, they went out there with a book, and on the cover of the book was a woman with flaming red hair, and that was his personification of Babylon. And it's just amazing when they come back from the ritual. This gorgeous red-headed vamp called Marjorie Cameron is waiting for Parsons in his. In, his, in the Pasadena Lodge. That was his Babylon. And she just it's even more amazing. She was the first person in the United States, I believe, to make an official report of seeing a UFO in the desert. And she became his muse and so on. And, you know, so the Babylon ritual, it actually worked. It worked. Now, unfortunately, Parsons died in an accident when he was working on a new kind of rocket fuel and the motor exploded in his garage and killed him. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there is a there's talk that he was assassinated because he was working as a subcontractor for the for the uh, Israeli military at the time. So there's there's all kinds of rumors that the, well it's probably it probably is, could be true that the that the FBI or CIA killed him because he was given rec, rock, you know records uh, details of American projects to the Israelis because they weren't allies at that time. But however, from that man's life, from two from two eight year old boys building rockets in the backyard, the Saturn V rocket landed on the moon. And you can draw a clean trajectory. And it's like, oh, my God. It's like, you know, they, they started the rocket motor company, Aerojet. They founded what became JPL. JPL brought over uh, Werner von Braun after the war for Project Blue, uh, Project, uh, Blue Book. Not Blue Book, uh, Project Paperclip. Paperclip. And, and, yeah. Yeah, and then that became the, the Apollo program, the Mercury program, Apollo program. The man landed on the mill. And it started with two little boys experimenting in past It's one of those kind of like, if it was, if it was written out as a fictional story, you wouldn't believe it. Mm.